The current war in Ukraine has taken its toll not only on people there, but also on the infrastructure and also the cultural heritage. Yep. So we're going to talk about that with you today. Mm -hmm. um, as of 25th of April, UNESCO has verified damage to 110 sites in Ukraine, 48 religious sites, 10 museums, 22 historic buildings, 11 buildings dedicated to cultural activities, 13 monuments, six libraries, and the number is rising rapidly. Mm -hmm. How would you evaluate the current situation in Ukraine? Uh, well, I mean, that list in a way says it all. There is extensive damage to cultural um, property. Uh, there is probably much more than that than uh, UNESCO can formally verify at the moment. Um, so I would anticipate that figure or those figures going up uh, not insignificantly over the next few weeks and months. Yeah, numbers reported by the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture are a little bit different and even yep. higher than, than the ones yep. noted. So my question is, uh, how can you gather the information about the, the, the damage done because the war is ongoing? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, that material, that evidence is collected in a variety of ways. Um, so some of it is with members of the general public just taking photographs on their phones and sending that information in but that has to be cross-referenced um, with images of that same place um, and to make sure that the photograph is of the same place as was before and what state that building was in before, the, before and after um, some uh, damage was done to it. Um, there are satellite imagery um, techniques that we can use and, and other images like that. Um, in some instances, you can get drone footage of buildings. So there's a whole package of information that we can pull together um, and that's why probably the UNESCO figures are lower than the Ukrainian figures because UNESCO, um, and this is no disrespect to the Ukrainian um, ministry, but will have a um, higher formal level of uh, evidence than perhaps the Ukrainians do on the ground because they can see what's going on, whereas UNESCO are doing it um, one stage removed. Uh, you're one of the leading experts when it comes to protection of cultural heritage, and it's not the first time that the modern world has seen such a destruction. Uh, if it's possible to compare what we see now in Ukraine to one of the recent wars, mm -hmm. Um, it, it's always possible to try to make comparisons, but comparisons are always fraught with difficulty because no two situations are ever the same. Um, there doesn't appear at the moment to be any strategic or tactical specific targeting of cultural sites in Ukraine. So it would be um, just so it's what people usually refer to as collateral damage. But there are questions that say, um, you know, why is the Russian Federation using the means of war that it is doing? Um, but a number of colleagues have told me um, that there is a church on almost every corner um, in Ukraine. So if the uh, Russian Federation or anybody is shelling an urban area, it's not surprising, therefore, that there are lots of churches that have been damaged um, because they're just there in the area. But it doesn't appear at the moment that there has been any specific targeting, as we saw, for example, um, under Daesh or um, when they attacked both the Yazidi people but also their cultural property, um, or Ansandine in Timbuktu in Mali, where they purposefully destroyed um, uh, Islamic sites that were deemed to be, um, in their extreme view of Islam, un-Islamic um, in their uh, construction. Yeah, but still, when we talk about the theatre and the museums, mm. they're still, you know... Oh, they're, they're certainly being damaged and um, it's, it's appalling, but war is appalling um, and so uh, I'm not going to lay any blame um, on anything until there is clear evidence. Um, and, and that's the point that we can begin to say something has happened. But Blue Shield 
is an independent, impartial, neutral organisation, very much like the International Committee of the Red Cross. So we, we don't um, point a finger of blame to any particular party in a conflict. What we do to all parties in the conflict is ask them to treat um, cultural property as they are expected to do under international legislation, under international instruments, and in a way that um, preserves that for future generations. Mm. Can it be even done in such a destructive war? It can be done, um, and the, one of the key elements is to start the process in peacetime. And unfortunately, one of the issues in um, the Ukrainian situation, but that's not, again, a unique um, instance, is that um, colleagues in Ukraine simply didn't believe that the Russian Federation was going to invade. And so some of the preparations that should have been put in place, with a, a few notable exceptions, had not been put in place. So they were immediately from the day after the 24th of February um, playing catch up. They were trying to do things that, they, that should have happened before the conflict started. And that's always a difficult situation to be in. So, for example, what could be done before the conflict and what did they not do? Okay, so if you've got a museum um, you and you th think that a, um, a conflict is either likely or even long before that, when there is peace, have you prepared um, that museum for an armed conflict? Now, most museums will say, oh yeah, we've got an emergency plan. But the emergency plan is frequently for a fire or for a flood or, or something like that. So something fairly specific to the building. It's not a stage many more times complicated um, as when you get to an armed conflict. Now, lots of countries say, um, well, we're never going to have an armed conflict. But, and so we, we don't need to plan for that. We don't need to put the time, the effort, the personnel, the resource, the finance to planning for an armed conflict. Um, but uh, we were talking earlier and, and somebody commented that it's um, much easier to plan for a problem than to try and respond to the problem once it's happened. Um, and that's what we encourage people to do as much as possible in peacetime, to develop the relationship between all of those potential actors. And we, en we envisage Blue Shield um, essentially as a triangle within a circle and the triangle as with all good triangles has three points and the three points are the heritage sector the humanitarian sector and what we call the uniform sector so not only the armed forces but border control police blue light services and the space in between that is where those professional entities can all work together we all start from very different perspectives, um, but we all have one end result in common. In Blue Shield language, that end result is the creation of healthy, peaceful, stable, sustainable communities. And that's what the military want, that's what the police want, that's what the humanitarian sector want. And we go about things in a different way, but within that triangle, that's what we try to do. But the triangle is set within the broader circle of the political environment and politics may um, lead cultural property to be used as an excuse for war or it may lead it to be a factor to be targeted in war. Then you have the legal aspects and what are the legal responsibilities for all of those um, different actors. And then finally, and increasingly important, is the role that people like yourself have, the media, and increasingly the role that the social media can play. So I said earlier, um, a positive element of social media is people being able to take photographs with their, um, uh, with their mobile phone um, about damage. And that can be immediately reported and logged, and we can begin to build up a picture. Um, there are, of course, negative elements um, to social media as well. And following the invasion of um, Iraq in 2003, um, the coalition and, and the West effectively lost 
the media and certainly the social media campaign there because um, they, the failures of the West to protect the heritage and the religious sites in Iraq um, led to an increasingly um, belligerent population who had originally just been wishing the coalition would leave after three years, but then um, it, it tipped that population into the full-scale sectarian civil war that caused the coalition to stay in Iraq for an additional five years, taking five years worth of casualties, five years worth of fatalities, and five years worth of bad publicity, and five years worth of oxygen to allow Islamic State in Iraq, um, sorry, um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq to develop, and then Daesh in the Islamic State, so-called, to develop. And that was part of the problem of not protecting cultural and religious property in Iraq. Mm. Back to Ukraine, though. Yeah. What can be done at the moment? So there are a lot of things that I only can guess we can do to... I mean, um, as I say, we're in the situation in Ukraine where it's, it's playing catch up. And um, so, yes, colleagues can, if they can get hold of the packing materials, pack up collections. And that's what many of them have been doing. And many of them have been doing, you know, risking um, uh, their, lives. their lives, exactly. Um, and the international community has been helping with that by sending in the packing materials, the conservation materials, um, all of that, that side of things, um, to try and match that with um, the need in Ukraine. So that's one of the things that has been going on and is continuing to go on. But then the next question, which should have been answered in peacetime, is, so now we've packed all this stuff, where do we put it? Um, okay, so if we put it in the basement, if there is a basement to this building, um, is that going to be safe? Or is it actually going to um, you know, be easier for perhaps looters um, to go in and say, thank you very much for packing this up, I'll just pick up this box and take it? Um, so there are all sorts of difficult questions to ask at that point. Should um, they try and move the collection to somewhere safer? The problem with that is, if you try to move a museum collection um, of any size, you're probably moving three or four or more lorries worth of material. And that looks um, remarkably like a military convoy to somebody from the air. And so you are opening an attack on that museum collection. Now you can try and negotiate with all of the parties to the conflict and say these three vehicles are removing cultural property so please don't damage it as you are not supposed to do under the 1954 Hague Convention. Um, but people may not believe that that's what's in those vehicles. There may not be a safe route out of that town or city. So it becomes very difficult, which is why all of this needs to be done in peacetime so that there is enough time to plan where things are going, how things are going to be protected. But that's not the only challenge, those lorries that you mentioned, because as far as I've heard that when you move the collection somewhere abroad, it's quite difficult to get all of it back after some time as well. There are issues about that. So the, f the first issue is, um, and I, I'm going to use sort of two technical terms, um, to move it to a refuge, um, so a place um, somewhere else that isn't under threat or as much threat in the same country. And so we saw um, in the early uh, days of the conflict, or in fact a couple of days before the conflict, the movement of um, a couple of museum collections from Kyiv to uh, Lviv and that was a more secure place to put them. The, the next step, which is the one you allude to, is moving them out of country to what would normally be called a safe haven and yes that requires a commitment from the country where you may take that material to, to look after that material keep it at the right environmental conditions, in the right conservation environment, etc., but also to return it back at an appropriate time 
um, when there is a, the conflict is over and there is a legitimate government in, in power. That can become difficult. Um, it, it shouldn't be, but again, all of that needs to be worked out before the conflict because trying to negotiate a, all of the legal requirements around a safe haven may take months and you don't have the um, luxury of months when you're in a situation as the Ukrainians are in at the moment. So you basically have to prepare for it as well? Absolutely. So my, uh, I've said um, in Estonia, in Latvia, and tomorrow I will say it in Lithuania, that um, the critical thing to realise is that to protect cultural property during an armed conflict, you have to start years beforehand, putting everything in place and getting the whole system ready um, in the hope that by planning, you will never have to um, uh, operate that system. You've mentioned looting quite yeah. a bit during our conversation. Is it even possible to avoid it during such conflicts? Um, it's possible to mitigate the amount of looting. It's probably not completely possible to, um, to stop all forms of looting. But if, again, be because Ukraine is such a, an ongoing um, conflict, it's difficult to unpick what's going on here at the moment. If I can take you back again to 2003 with the looting of the National Museum in Iraq, um, the late Donny George, uh, then director of uh, research for the National Museum, identified seven different reasons and seven different groups who were looting the museum. And so looting it isn't a straightforward, simple um, exercise. Um, there were people looting material and damaging the paper records of the museum because they weren't interested in any of the museum records, but they were in interested in um, the documentation relating to people who had disappeared under the Saddam Hussein regime. And because the museum was a government building, they thought, some of that information might be in that building. There were people who were looting because it was an opportunity. There were people who were um, looting, but not the archaeological collections, um, the tables and chairs and air conditioning units, um, uh, table lamps, all of those things were being removed from the museum and looted from the museum. There were people who were looting um, but they were taking things to safeguard them and many of those were brought back later um, once the situation had stabilised. And I suppose finally, and I haven't covered all seven, but there were people who were um, looting to order um, where people who um, were um, in a different country, were wealthy collectors, had said, um, I know that that object is in the National Museum go and steal it for me and I, we will pay you a lot of money. Of course. So that was going on as well. So, but, so looting is, is not a straightforward or easy um, thing to, to discuss. And that was just at the National Museum. In the, um, in the rural areas uh, in um, Iraq, local farmers were, um, who in the past had had only one outlet for their produce, which was the government, the coalition had destroyed the government, had removed that um, opportunity for the farmers to sell their produce. And so they turned to the only other crop they could think of harvesting, which was the antiquities. So the, um, the failure of the coalition to put in place the purchase of those farm produce um, led to the looting of archeological sites. Jesus. Um. Yeah, so looting is one thing that is very hard to avoid. Another thing uh, that has been mentioned quite a bit is uh, burying buildings with UNESCO back Blue Shield that signals cultural heritage yep. and um, violation of international law targeting those buildings would be considered a war crime. But um, to be honest, we've seen that uh, when it comes to Russian part, it, doesn't seem too concerned about committing any war crimes. There's, um, and again, I'm I'm not going to sort of, I'm not I'm not taking any sides. But um, 
uh, of course it's a challenge, um, but there in the 54 Convention, there is a clause which is called military necessity. So um, the, uh, the argument there is that you mustn't destroy any cultural property intentionally unless there is um, a military need to do so. So the way I describe that is if you're fighting in a town or a city which is divided by a river, so looking out of the window, a good example. Um, if there are three um, bridges across that river, two of them are modern bridges and one is a historic bridge. Um, while all three bridges are there, the both sides or all sides to the conflict should not use the historic bridge. Okay? And that's protecting the cultural property of that, um, that historic bridge. If, however, both of the modern bridges have been destroyed and to achieve your military objective, you have to be on the other side of the river, then it may become military necessity to use the historic bridge. So that's the sort of situation where normally no side should use that historic bridge, but there may become a situation where it becomes um, unrealistic to think of any other option. But there are still a lot of buildings as well, oh, and churches yeah. that you've yeah. mentioned almost on every corner. Absolutely. And some of uh, those buildings date back to what, 11th, 12th century? Yep, and that's an appalling loss of cultural property. And, you know, we would um, urge all parties to a conflict um, to use the most appropriate means of fighting that conflict. Now, that may not mean um, sort of blanket shelling or bombing um, a city. Um, but uh, that's where the distinction over, you know, fighting the war in the most appropriate way sometimes doesn't always um, happen. But by, n by not pointing the finger, um, the aspiration of the Blue Shield is that we can work with all parties to a conflict behind the scenes to try and lower the potential of damage to cultural property across the board. Is it possible at this time? It's possible to change the military tactics. Um, it's difficult once uh, one party to a, a conflict has decided that this is how they're going to, to fight the conflict. Um, but we are um, in, in other conflicts that have been going on for longer, um, we are working behind the scenes with with all parties and we are helping to lower the risk to cultural property as a result. Is it happening now? Yes. Are I mean, there any... Do you mean in Ukraine? Yes. Or, okay, yeah. so um, I mean I'm, I'm sorry, can't talk about any specifics yes. about what's going on um, in any particular instance but, but that's our aspiration and that's what we try to do and we're certainly doing that in a number of instances. So what happens after war? Um, I mean, is there any usual process of returning the heritage home? That's one thing that you said there is a challenge yeah. with the safe haven, uh, repairing the damaged one yep. that stayed there. So, I mean, um, in terms of um, the return of material and the such, the, the what's called the first protocol to the Hague Convention, the 1954 protocol, um, speaks to the return of material and so there is a legal obligation from those um, countries that have taken material to protect it to return it um, when there is an appropriate um, government or system to return it to. So I'm not particularly worried about the return of material from overseas from a safe haven um, to a country where it's been moved from. But again, I would reiterate that I'd be much happier if the legal requirements of all of that had been put in place months, if not years, before the situation arose so that both sides were very clear about their obligations and, and what was supposed to happen. Um, in terms of what happens at the end of a conflict about damaged um, sites, that's really up to the, um, the authorities in the country 
um, who want to do um, one of a number of things. So at the end of the Second World War, um, the different countries took very different routes in that. So for example, in the UK, um, there are examples of churches that had been damaged in, um, specifically damaged or damaged just as collateral damage during um, the Blitz. Um, and the choice in the UK was to leave those as war memorials. So Coventry Cathedral is the probably most famous of, of, of those. Um, there was another one uh, where I uh, did my, in the town where I did my PhD in Southampton, where there was a, um, a, um, a big church which was close to the port, which had been the target of the bombing campaign, um, but the church had been damaged and um, ruined in the same uh, uh, bombing raids. So the UK tended to memorialise things in, in that way. If you take um, Poland, for example, uh, where the centre of old Warsaw was completely destroyed, because the Poles had astonishingly good architectural records of that historic centre, they were able to rebuild the historic centre um, as it looked almost as well as it looked or possibly looked even better because it was new build um, following the Second World War. But that goes to the heart of the whole issue about the importance of cultural property because both of those um, uh, different responses, the memorialization or the rebuilding, um, are community responses to wanting cultural property back in some form or another. And that's the critical thing. Mm. Uh, the last question I have for you is that, um, as mentioned many times before, the destruction of cultural heritage and heritage buildings is a war crime. Um, can you explain a little bit the consequences of that? Yeah. So <coughs> well, the first point is it can be a war crime. It it's not always a war crime. So if you take the situation that it is a war crime, um, there are a number of different mechanisms to prosecute people um, for a war crime against cultural property, um, and there have been convictions of that. Um, what that needs, though, is obviously good evidence in terms of uh, what uh, happened in a particular place. So the most famous recent example of this um, was the prosecution and conviction of Mr. Al Mahdi um, at the International Criminal Court in The Hague in relation to the destruction of nine mausolea and a mosque in Timbuktu in Mali. And um, the evidence that, we're, or a lot of the evidence that was used in that prosecution, um, which led to the conviction, was um, media footage taken by Ansandine with Mr. Al Mahdi um, in, the, in the video explaining why the mausoleum behind him or the mosque behind him was offensive under their strict uh, interpretation of Islam and therefore his unit um, were going to now destroy the mausoleum. Now that was put up by Ansandine as a recruitment tool um, for there, but it also was a major contributing factor to um, his prosecution and conviction. So you have to have the good evidence, and there in that particular instance, um, the people who were being prosecuted provided a lot of that evidence. Um, but it's much more difficult to do in a conflict situation, especially where there is a lot of damage happening. Um, so it's going to be very difficult to say that church was targeted specifically or um, you know at the same level that this whole area was targeted because of the way that one side was fighting um, a campaign and that's where it becomes much more difficult to have credible evidence but there are people and that goes back until um, the um, uh, Nuremberg trials where uh, Nazis were convicted for war crimes against cultural property, in most instances looting that, that property. Um, 
But actually, in military theorists have been arguing for the last two and a half thousand years that the destruction of cultural property is not a thing that the military should do because it causes problems for the military. And effectively, you are, by allowing cultural property to be damaged, or worse, damaging it yourself, you're creating the next reason for the next war. And so from Sun Shao in 6th century BC China, all the way through military theorists, there have been those arguments that destroying cultural property is a stupid thing to do. Um, the earliest uh, instance that I've found so far of a formal military um, requirement not to do that is from 1635, the so-called, no, sorry, 1385, get it right, 1385, the so-called Durham Ordinances, which were the rules for the English army that were just about to invade Scotland. And there, there was a clause which said that the English army, no soldiers were allowed to damage or destroy any religious buildings. And the penalty for that was the same penalty for rape, which was execution. Wow. I thank you so much for the... Thank you.